Hey, and welcome to Comics Crash Course. So last episode ended on a cliffhanger. As the moral panic against comics seemed to reach a crescendo, even the federal government got involved by dedicating three sessions of the Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency entirely to the comic book menace. So, yes, a Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency? Let's back up a step. In the 1950s, society had moved on from a wartime culture with restrictions on media and goods, even food. During the war, World War II, many families lived in single-parent households as fathers were drafted, and many mothers had to go to work to make ends meet. So kids were expected to step up around the house. Then, the men came back, and most women had to leave their wartime jobs, and kids' roles in their homes and communities changed again. We're at a point where we're transitioning from more and more young people staying in high school, not quitting, to work, and even then going to college. And it's actually around this time that the word teenager gets coined in the first place. Plus, American society was increasingly urban and even suburban, so there are more people in the same place. And on top of it, new media like rock and roll and TV were gaining footholds, and as always, adults were not getting that. This exacerbated already existing generational divides, and, well, there was an increase in crime. According to some statistics, crime committed by teens nearly doubled nationwide in the years following World War II. The extent to which this is specific to youth or a reflection of changing society is hard to pin down. But adults were pretty sure it was the influx of new media that was causing the spike in juvenile delinquency. And of course, that would be easier to fix than creating massive societal changes. And figuring out the media problem was actually the point of the Senate subcommittee. Here's a quote from the subcommittee's interim report. The need existed for a thorough, objective investigation to determine whether, as has been alleged, certain types of mass communication media are to be reckoned with as contributing to the country's alarming rise in juvenile delinquency. The Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency was established in 1953 by a bipartisan group of senators, most famously including Estes Kefauver, and held its televised public hearings dedicated to the comic book problem on April 21st and 22nd, and on June 4th, 1954. The hearings featured pro and anti-comic book crusaders who did their best for both sides, as well as a few more neutral voices. But the star witnesses were Frederick Wortham against comic books and EC comics publisher Bill Gaines for comic books. They both testified on the first day. Wortham testified just before Gaines, but Gaines' testimony led to perhaps the most famous exchange of the hearings. This exchange will also sum up how well the hearings went for comics. Herbert Beezer, chief counsel, begins by asking Gaines, You think a child cannot, in any way, shape, or manner, be hurt by anything the child reads or sees? Gaines replies, I don't believe so. Beezer follows up, asking, There would be no limit, actually, to what you would put in the magazines? Only within the bounds of good taste, says Gaines. Beezer, Your own good taste and sellability. Yes, says Gaines. Then, Senator Kefauver interjects, here is your May 22nd issue. This seems to be a man with a bloody axe holding a woman's head up, which has been severed from her body. Do you think that is in the bounds of good taste? Gaines answers. Yes, sir, I do for the cover of a horror comic. A cover in bad taste, for example, might be defined as holding the head a little higher so that the neck could be seen dripping blood from it, and moving the body over a little further so that the neck of the body could be seen to be bloody. Kefauver replies. You have blood coming out of her mouth. A little, says Gaines. Yeah, so not well. In September of 1954, the Comics Magazine Association of America decided to get ahead the problem. Comics publishers tried to implement a comics code in 1948, one that they had based on Hollywood's Hayes Code, but it was largely unenforced. So with the public sentiment turning against comics now, the CMAA couldn't make that mistake again. They appointed Charles Murphy, a judge specializing in juvenile delinquency, as head of the Comics Code Authority, and he led a team to write the Comics Code. Though the code wasn't legally binding, comic book wholesalers would refuse to distribute books without the seal. This meant that any book without the Comics Code seal would not be distributed to general stores and newsstands. And because this was before there were any specialty comic book shops, Readers had to purposely seek out and subscribe to books that they couldn't find on the stands. In other words, it was essentially a death sentence to publish a book without the seal. So, what was in the code? Of course, it includes rules against gore or nudity, but it was full of insanely restrictive details. You can read the whole thing online, but highlights include things like 
All authority figures like policemen and government officials had to be presented respectfully at all times. The good guys always had to win, and evil could never be presented alluringly. No zombies, vampires, ghouls, cannibals, or werewolves. Oh, and no swear wolves either, or slang. Good grammar was encouraged. Uh, forget representation, even references to physical afflictions and deformities in dialogue were to be avoided. And when it came to relationships, parents were to be treated respectfully and romantic relationships had to emphasize, and I quote, the value of the home and the sanctity of marriage. And even old material was subject to the code. If reprinted, it had to be brought into compliance. Take, for example, these Joe Simon and Jack Kirby Captain America pages. Apparently the issue wasn't the racist yellow apparel imagery, even though there is a line about racism in the 1954 code. No, Fang's large head was too grotesque, and the woman chained to the table had to go. Or there's this red skull page. The publishers get around the restrictions on his zombie-like features by changing his face shape and making his hand pink. The code was pretty strict stuff. And frankly, only kid stuff. And more than that, really like the fantasy-tinged version of superhero comics really could survive these guidelines. I think this is where the idea that comics are for kids gets stuck in to the American conscious. It's a vicious cycle, of course. Comics had to be censored because they were for kids. But that meant that the only comics that could get produced were kid-friendly, reinforcing the idea that comics were for kids. And now you still get articles published saying comics aren't for kids anymore. EC Comics tried to fight the code for a little while, to do their thing in compliance with it. But to get a sense of not only how strict, but how arbitrary the code could be, especially when you were up against a particularly persnickety judge, let me tell you the story of Judgment Day. In February of 1956, Angelo Torres' story in Eye for an Eye, which was said to be published in Incredible Science Fiction number 33, was rejected by code censors. In its place, Gaines submitted a well-known pre-code story called Judgment Day, which had originally appeared in Weird Fantasy No. 18 in April of 1953. The story by writer Al Feldstein and artist Joe Orlando was an allegory against racial prejudice. And in the final panel, the main character is revealed to be a black man. Charles Murphy, who was then head of the code, told them that the story was rejected and demanded that they change the story so that the main character wasn't black. Gaines was furious. The whole point of the story was that the main character was black, and there was nothing in the code about that. Gaines engaged in a heated dispute with Murphy. He threatened to inform the press of Murphy's objection to the story if they did not give the issue the code. Murphy finally said fine, but only if they would remove the beads of sweat from the man's face. The text in the last panel of Crashers is a beautiful line that ends, the perspiration on his face twinkled like stars. There were expletives exchanged, Gaines accusing Murphy of interfering specifically with him and EC, and even though the story did end up getting published with the seal. Shortly after, Gaines quit comic publishing entirely to concentrate on Mad Magazine. In 1952, there were over 3,000 comic book publications per year in the U.S. In 1959, five years after the code, there were around 1,500. Many publishers shut their doors entirely, and hundreds of artists ended up jobless. It's not all the code's fault. This is precisely the time when TVs became more prevalent in American households, and that inevitably played a role. However, such intense restrictions on content hampered publishers and artists, and turned away readers who were looking for anything outside of kid-friendly books, and into the light of the TV screen. Yet another vicious cycle. The code was periodically updated, so werewolves came back, for example, but shockingly some form of the code's seal of approval appeared on covers of comic books of major publishers until around 2010. In 2001, Marvel abandoned the seal, but DC Comics and Archie Comics were the last holdouts, phasing it off their covers finally in 2011, just seven years ago. But where there's life, there's hope. And though the comics industry was almost cut in half, they didn't die out entirely. And while the wild and wacky golden age had come to an end, a new age was about to begin. But that's next time. See you then.